Peter Triton, a.k.a. Posh Pete, the international cocaine trafficker. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thanks for inviting me, Cavario. Nice to be here. You as well. Um, I'm going to do a quick bio uh -huh. for, uh, for the sake of our subscribers who may not be familiar with your story. Yeah. Uh, you were born in 1976 in a town called Stroud, yep. which is in uh, Gloucestershire uh -huh. in England. Yeah. Uh, if you were raised in a village called um, Avening uh -huh. uh, until you were 18. Yep. Um, at age 14, you started hustling weed and ecstasy throughout the local party scene in Probably a little bit uh, younger than that. countryside. Probably a little bit younger than that, but yeah, that's yeah. about right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> we don't get into that. Um, in 1993, at age 17, you were busted for selling weed and LSD. This seemingly shook you up a bit and uh, upset your family, so you decided to stop dealing instead and uh, instead go to university or college, as we say on this side of the pond. Um, by 1995, you were studying archaeology at Cardiff, a local university. Mm -hmm. Before long, you were moving up to a key uh, of coke a week. Uh, you eventually dropped out of school, but continued to expand your network into other parts of the UK. Yeah. By this time, you were pushing upwards of 22 pounds of hash, 30,000 ecstasy pills, five keys of coke a month. In May of 2000, more, at around right, age anyway. 24, <laughs> you were arrested in England with 5,000 ecstasy pills, several pounds of weed, two keys of meth, 163 grams of heroin, and just enough cocaine for an intimate party, along with a sort of shotgun. <laughs> You were sentenced to five years in prison, of which you did half. You were given a Category A classification, so you spent most of the time in maximum security, relatively isolated. You were released in 2002 at age 26 and immediately started shopping for cocaine connection, which you eventually found. A Colombian named Nico, who got it for you right out of the ground. Nico is, is the, the name we gave him in the book, because obviously the guy's still I figured alive, that. unfortunately, but <laughs> carry on. I, I figured that. Yeah, yeah. I figured that. <laughs> All right. So in June 2005, uh, you slipped out of London on the run from a major cocaine conspiracy case. A few months earlier, British drug agents from the Serious Organized Crime Agency, or SOCA for short, had busted two Colombians in a cocaine laboratory, quote unquote, inside an apartment in a small but famous city called Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh. the capital of Scotland, UK. Edinburgh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How do you pronounce it? Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Well, my okay. pronunciation's not much better than yours, but anyway, I <laughs> will get there. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's it's going to definitely get funny with yeah, you yeah. know between the different <laughs> pronunciations and accents from your side to my side. You say side. tomato, I say tomato, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> so while on the run, you pondered the seriousness of your situation and decided to quit the game, but not before one last run. On August 16, two thousand five, you and your girlfriend were arrested in uh, Quito, Ecuador. Uh, by local police at the behest of Interpol. Uh, you were just 29 years old. Uh, the two of you were charged with uh, charged for uh, multi-kilo narcotics trafficking. Uh, you were sentenced to 12 years in the treacherous uh, Ecuadorian prison system, uh -huh. a fair-skinned foreigner who didn't speak the language. In July 2017, you published your book, El Infierno, yeah. which is hell in English, subtitled Drugs, Guns, Riots, and Murders. I read uh, uh, 130 pages of it yesterday, but I'm halfway through it. I'm enjoying it. I'm really enjoying it. I'm glad. Um, so, first question, what was it like for you growing up in Cotswolds, uh, or <laughs> was it actually leafy? I love the pronunciations. Yeah, the Cotswolds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, um, yeah, growing up there, it was, uh, you know, the sort of idyllic English countryside, uh, you know, the sort of things you see in the films, um, you know, growing up in a small village, uh, right next door to Prince Hassan, uh, who is the who yeah who is the daughter of the Queen, or our, our now dead Queen. So, you know, in in a very um, very nice area of the countryside, or of the, sorry, of the country, um, very affluent, but. My dad was a builder and my mum wasn't working, so there wasn't a great deal of money coming into our house. Uh, so, yeah, but, you know, typical so countryside you, upbringing. You had, you, so you had, you had a, a, a fairly uneventful child life, not a lot of trauma. Uh, I wouldn't say that. I mean, <laughs> my, yeah, there was plenty of trauma. It comes a little bit in stages later on. 
But um, I mean, basically, but as a child, as a little kid, yeah, yeah. I mean, my 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 dad when I was growing up was smoking hash. Yeah, his friends were coming around. There was parties going on. Um, so I actually first ended up getting stoned by accident at the age of four. Um, my um, one of my dad's friends was having a party, and uh, they cooked up a hash cake. And uh, my mum didn't realise the chocolate cake. Gave me a big slice of this chocolate cake, and uh, obviously I, I I got wrecked <laughs> uh, at the age of four. So that was uh, a christening into the world of okay. drugs. Um, I, mean, what, but then, I mean, that's not traumatic. Yeah, well, that's not traumatic. But then my mum started drinking. She became a heavy alcoholic. She was having psychotic episodes every time she drank, getting extremely violent, and that was almost daily. So my parents end up getting divorced when I'm 10. Uh, my mum moves out. Me and my sister stay with my dad. Um, so yeah, it sort of starts going downhill from there, really, to some extent. Right. right. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, the thing that stuck out to me, and once I looked into, you know, what uh, Cotswolds was, was like, I was like, how, how does a person who comes from this kind of environment how do they get to a point of making these kinds of choices? So, so I'm, I'm glad you kind of shared that insight into, you know, yeah. your parents' condition and so forth, because I mean, obviously um, those kinds of things, psychotic episodes and, you know, shit like that yeah. is, is definitely going to impact a, a kid's yeah, self-perception. Easy. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, so how did you get started selling drugs? So when my parents got divorced, uh, like I said, my mum moved out. And um, the guy that she got together with was actually, as it happens, the, the, uh, a friend of my dad's and the very same friend who had that party that day where I got stoned by the hash cake. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this guy had two sons who were both older than me. And the eldest of the two was uh, quite a well-known local DJ. And they were heavily involved in selling ecstasy, um, and other drugs, mainly ecstasy, because of the illegal rave scene that was taken off at the end of the 80s. And they were involved in organising these parties in warehouses, um, you know, out in the countryside, in cities, all over the place in, in the local area. Um, so, you, you know, I then became like the youngest of the three. How old were you? Well, like I said, I was 10 when, they, when my parents got divorced, so my mum was together with this guy straight away. Um, so, you know, I started secondary school at, uh, or what would it be in America? Um, what's your middle school, middle, middle school? school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the age of 11. Yeah. Um, so around that time, so I see all these, you know, I see them starting to go to parties, uh, these illegal raves, all of that starting to kick off. Um, and like I said, there wasn't much money coming in and I, sort of realized that it was quite easy to sell drugs at these parties. You know, it was, I, it was easy for me to get them off my stepbrothers. Uh, there were a lot of drugs in the area. Stroud is a kind of a renowned hippie town in, in Britain. Uh, it's always been renowned as having a, quite a big drugs problem. For such a small town, it's got quite a big reputation as being, you know, full of drugs. I think because really? of a lot of the hippies were... Settled in there in the 60s, 50s and 60s into the 70s. Um, so it's kind of, there's a list in Britain. It's like Glastonbury, which everybody's heard of where the music festival is. That's a real hippie town. Totnes down in, I think it's Devon, and then Stroud. They're all, those three towns are sort of quite, quite sort of renowned as having a bit of a drug uh, thing about them. So, okay. so... Um, you're in this party scene, you're like well, 11, I'm, 12 I'm years old. I'm starting to get into it. Um, my dad had got together with somebody and she also had a couple of kids that were both older than me, quite a bit older than me. Mm -hmm. And um, again, one of them was involved in smoking hash and drugs and stuff like that. So, so it was going on all around me, do you know what I mean? Right. Um, so... You know, I want to start making a bit of money to help my mum out because she's broke all the time. Um, you know, I'm not, you know, as a kid, you want to help your family, you're trying to help your mum, stuff like that. Right. You just want to sort of right. lift her out of the problems. So, right. you know, I, like I said, I saw selling drugs as an easy way of doing it. 
having gone to a couple of the illegal raves, I realised that it was really easy to sell drugs in these parties because the police didn't really get involved. They would let the party happen. They put a cordon around the outside and just let the party carry on. So if you were in there and you had, like I had my stepbrothers and all their friends around, it felt quite safe, yeah, you know, because um, they were sort of running the place. So I knew that I could get away with it um, and started, basically. I mean, most of the initial dealing was at school, to schoolmates, classmates, and then at the weekends, at the parties, it would be, to, you know, again, mainly to people I knew, but then at 21, really, at the parties. Um, and things just built up from there. Uh, up until I got arrested, like us, like you mentioned earlier, um, at the age of 17. So, um, uh, was that your first bus? The, the, the 17 year old, that 17 years old? Yeah. yeah. Years old? Um, I mean, I'd, I'd gone through school, second, uh, mid off school, as you call it. Um, did quite well, you know, I was quite gifted academically, got a load of uh, like 12 GCSEs, which would be, I don't know what your, what's the, what's the qualifications in America? Should I dropped out of school in 10th grade, baby? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean, whatever people do in middle school, whatever they're called, I don't know what they're called over there. Um, but anyway, I, I got, a, you know, got a load of uh, certificates. Um, and then I moved from that school, from middle school to, to like sixth form college, which is to do like pre-university uh, mm -hmm. level. Uh, so when I moved, met a whole new bunch of people who were also involved in drugs, taking drugs. So things are just expanding, getting bigger and bigger, you know, over time, getting to know more people, getting to know more dealers, more sources for drugs. I've now got sources for all sorts of stuff all over the place. Um, okay. and when I was at sixth form college, uh, some, somebody go on. So, so when did you, when did you make your first international trafficking move? That came a little bit later. Like that oh, came okay. a little bit later. So I, so okay. I, so I get so, arrested, uh, at 17 when I'm at sixth form right. college cause somebody put uh -huh. information in about me. Um, so that kind of just stopped me dead in my tracks. Um, I didn't want to jeopardize my future. I didn't want to lose the chance of going to university. Didn't want to, you know, fuck up my life basically. Right. Um, of course, obviously it upset my mum. My dad was pretty pissed off. Um, at the time of my arrest, he was actually abroad in France. He'd recently bought a, uh, like a holiday home over there. Mm. And, um, when he found out that I'd been busted, because uh, the police had raided, had like come to the home in Avening, knocked on the door as I was getting ready to leave for college. And, uh, you know, I've got uh, two ounces of hash on me. Anyway, they find it, arrest me. When my dad found out, instead of saying, oh, you shouldn't be doing that, it's bad, you know, bearing in mind he used to smoke a lot of hash himself. Instead of that, he kind of said, he told me off for getting caught. He said, you should, not, you should be doing it better. <laughs> you shouldn't have done it like that. You, you know, he sort of gave me advice rather than, rather than telling me off. Mm -hmm. Gave me all the wrong signals. So that was like a bit of a let off, really. So yeah. I thought, well, you know, if he's, if he's telling me to do it better and not get caught, then what am I going to do? I'm going to try and do it better, obviously. That's right. But initially, like I said, it stopped me, stopped me dead in my tracks. And, I, you know, the college expelled me. Uh, but they allowed me to sit my exams. So I had to uh, revise, do the revision at home. Um, so I did that through the summer, managed to get four A-levels. And uh, with those, managed to gain uh, four offers from different universities around the country. Uh, one was from Liverpool, the other was from Bradford, uh, another from Southampton, and the last from Cardiff, uh, which is the one I opted for.